All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And happy Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Amen. What a blessing. What an honor it is to be called a child of the Most High God. And uh, my name is Josh Maltzberger. Welcome to the Spokane Dream Center Sunday School. And um, it really is. It's a blessing, an honor, a privilege to have the opportunity to have new life in Christ, to be called to be able to teach and to profess the good news in and amongst believers here, of course, but uh, even out in the world. You know, God has sent us into the world to, to preach the good news. And so, what is that good news? We celebrate it today. As believers, we celebrate it every day. Amen? Right? The power of the resurrection. That which upon all of the Bible, all of eternity, hinges upon this day, this resurrection day. If there's no resurrection... We have no hope, right? No, we're going to read part of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul talks about that. We're going to go into, we're going to go throughout the Bible this morning. We're taking a, a detour away from Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to talk about resurrection life. We're going to talk about the third day. Remember, I don't know if it was last week or maybe the week before, we talked a little bit about the significance of Christ rising again on the third day according to the scriptures. And I asked presented to you like where is that in the old testament where is that in the scriptures that jesus talked about and i said that was kind of your homework you could go study that out well i did your homework for you so we're going to uh <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about that we're going to i'm going to hopefully by the power of the holy spirit show you throughout the scriptures how this is patterned from the very beginning god had jesus christ and the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and new life in mind. And my hope is that you will have a deeper and greater, that all of us will have a deeper, greater appreciation for God, for his love for us, and the fact that he had this plan in place before the foundation of the world, with our salvation in mind, should absolutely drive us to worship. Amen? So, let's pray, and then we'll begin. Heavenly Father, God, I'm so grateful, so honored, and, and blessed, Lord God, for the grace and the mercy which you extended to the whole world and to me on Calvary. Lord God, I'm so grateful that you have the power of life and death. Lord, you laid down your life, Jesus, but you also said that you had the power to pick it back up. God, you truly are Lord of the universe. And you are our risen Lord. God, our whole faith is dependent upon the resurrection. But God, you've given us such great evidence, Lord God. Such great evidence, Lord, for your resurrection. Lord, and the, even the internal witness and the, the changed lives that we see around us are a living testimony, Lord God, of the power of your resurrection life. God, we are so grateful, so blessed to have the opportunity to study your word. God, would you fill me with the Holy Spirit? Would you fill your people, God, with the Holy Spirit? Would you give us ears to hear, hearts that are soft? Lord, help us to be good soil, Lord, that this word would uh, stick inside of us and grow and produce good fruit, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory this morning and for all of eternity, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. And I want to thank my two kiddos, Sam and Jojo, for passing out the, uh, you know, the papers this morning with the lyrics to a, a song that we'll play at the end of the, at the end of the message this morning, so, but if you even just, it actually started as a poem, so it was a poem written by somebody that somebody turned into a song, and so, just in your own time, have it somewhere, it's good to read every once in a while, it's, it's pretty powerful, powerful concepts to think about, powerful truths. Okay, well, let's start here in Luke 24 and verse 1. Now, I hope at some point in your walk, and maybe you did it this morning, but it's good to, at any point in the year, but certainly around Easter, you know, you've got all four of those Gospels and the, and the, uh, the witness of the risen Lord. And so I've got it in here, if you read Matthew 28. Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. And read them all together in the same day, right? And put together all four of those accounts and let them minister to you. 
take the time to really study the scriptures, to really take all of those accounts in and let God minister to you. Uh, I think that I know that it will benefit you. It will it'll grow your faith. Um, but today, because, because of time, and because I want to go back, all the way back to Genesis, we're not going to read all four of those chapters. But let's just read part of the first part of Luke 24. It says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices which they had made ready. And they found the stone rolled back from the tomb. But when they went inside, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed and wondering what to do about this, behold, two men in dazzling raiment suddenly stood beside them. And as the women were frightened and were bowing their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among those who are dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be given over into the hands of sinful men, men whose way or, or nature is to act in opposition to God, and be crucified and on the third day rise from death? And they remembered his words. Hallelujah. Why are you searching for the living among the dead? He has risen. He has risen. To newness of life. To newness of life. What great hope we have in, in Christ. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And again, I I would encourage you, we're not going to read, we might not read all of it today, but read all of chapter 15 in conjunction with those other four chapters uh, in in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, and 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to read the first couple verses here, starting at verse 1. And now let me remind you, since it seems to have escaped you, brethren, of the gospel, the glad tidings of salvation which I proclaimed to you, which you welcomed and accepted, and upon which your faith rests, and by which you are saved, if you hold fast and keep firmly what I preached to you, unless you believed at first without effect and all for nothing. For I passed on to you, first of all, what I also had received, that Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for our sins in accordance with what the scriptures foretold, that he was buried, that he arose on the third day as the scriptures foretold. Amen? That he arose according to the scriptures on the third day. And, and, and don't lose sight of the fact of the first couple verses there. Again, the importance of the resurrection is Way too much to try to teach on in 45 minutes, and we're not even going to go there today, but we will some other day. Um, but even just the weight of what Paul is saying, you know, it's by which you are saved. Without this gospel, we're not saved. We're condemned. We're heading to hell without this gospel. But it's if we hold fast and keep firmly what has been preached. And that's the the key, the pinnacle part of the message is that Christ the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he arose on the third day. That's the good news. That's the gospel. Now, Jesus, do you know how many times Jesus mentions three days throughout the Gospels? 21 times. 21 times Jesus references three days in the Gospel. And you might just think, you know, but I mean, so the question becomes, okay, why not four days? Why not just rise the next day? You know, you still overcame death. Well, it's important to God because God laid out this plan from the very beginning. God is fulfilling. This helps you, this should help you and me, to look back to the Old Testament and go, God 
you are so good. You were so wise. You were so ahead of schedule. You're outside of time. You knew what you were doing, and you were prophetically giving us a picture of what was to come, and Christ, you fulfilled it to the pinnacle, to the X degree. You can't fulfill it any greater than what Christ did, because everything in the Old Testament is a pattern and a picture that points to Jesus and what he was going to do, and he fulfilled it, and then the culmination of us experientially is going to be when we are also resurrected with Christ. Right? So, this is an incredible theme. We are not going to go through all 21, but let's go to, let's go back to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 and verse 40. And this is the one that I said, you'll probably remember this one. <clears throat> Jesus said, we'll start in 39, he, but he replied to them, an evil and adulterous generation, a generation morally unfaithful to God, seeks and demands a sign, but no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For even as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Go to Mark chapter 8. And verse 31. And he, speaking of Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must be necessity, must of necessity suffer many things and be tested and disapproved and rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be put to death, and after three days rise again from death. So Jesus was teaching it. He gave a, he gave a picture with, with Jonah. He alluded back to the Old Testament in that situation, and then he's, he's, he's speaking it out, that that's what must happen. Luke chapter 9 And verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be deliberately disapproved and repudiated and rejected on the part of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be put to death and on the third day be raised again. Keep going in the Gospels, John chapter 2. And verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy, undo this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Then the Jews replied, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he had spoken of the temple, which was his body. Now, John may not have even understood that when it was happening, but as he looked back and wrote his gospel, he understood Post-resurrection, he was talking about his body. The book of Acts, chapter 10, and verse 37. The same message which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism preached by John. How God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, and with strength and ability and power. How he went about doing good, and in particular, curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil, for God was with him. And we are eye and ear witnesses of everything that he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And yet they put him out of the way, murdered him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him to life on the third day and caused him to be manifest, to be plainly seen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, throughout the New Testament, Jesus talks, he points back to the Old Testament, then he talks about it to his disciples, he says this is what's going to happen, this is what has to happen, and then in, in the book of Acts, the followers at the beginning of the church, they're proclaiming as the church is beginning to expand, this is the truth, this is what we are preaching to you, we are eye and ear witnesses of this truth, and on that truth, his resurrection on the third day, your faith rests. So, 
Why the third dig? Now we'll go back. We'll go back to Genesis chapter 1. Now, anybody seen this? I'm just going to ask. I had not seen this before as I studied this out. But, you know, maybe you maybe you had. How many days are there in the in the creation account? Okay? Yeah, 7 days in the creation account. So, we're going to start at verse 1. And we're going to go through Verse 13, in the beginning, God prepared, formed, fashioned, and created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and an empty waste, and darkness was upon the face of the very great deep. The Spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, suitable, pleasant, and he approved it, and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. And God said, let there be a firmament, the expanse of the sky in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters below from the waters above. And God made the firmament, the expanse, and separated the waters, which were under the expanse from the waters, which were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the firmament heavens, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be collected into one place of standing, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the accumulated waters he called seas. And God saw that this was good, fitting, admirable, and he approved it. And God said, let the earth put forth tender vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit, trees yielding fruit whose seed is in itself, each according to its kind upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which was their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, suitable, admirable, and he approved it. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. So what happened on the third day? On the third day, you see, what you have is the earth being formed, and the seas being formed, and what's coming out of the earth, something that is dead, vegetation that has fruit and seed, life. So on the third day, in the Genesis account, you have life coming out of non-life. You have the ground, you have the, I'm giving it away, you have the tomb producing out of the tomb, out of that, on the third day, out of the tomb, newness of life. In the creation account, out of that dirt that was formed, new life. God produces and brings about new life, a new creation. In the very beginning. Now, what about, let's go to, I can't go through the whole creation account. Let's go to verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, and wild beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the wild beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and domestic animals according to their kinds, and everything that creeps upon the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, fitting, and pleasant, and he approved it. God said, Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame beasts, and over all the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, using all its vast resources in the service of God and man, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves upon the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the land, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to all the animals on the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the ground, to everything in which there is the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, suitable, pleasant, and he approved it completely. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. So, on the third day, we have life coming from the dirt, from non-life. And on the second, third day, the sixth day, you have the same thing. God creating the animals and then God creating man and breathing life into man on the sixth day. You have life coming from that which is not alive. New, newness of life. On the third day and the sixth day, the second set of days. We are not going to go through every three days throughout the Old Testament. But it, at the very beginning, that is God's pattern. So when Paul talks about in accordance with the scriptures, there's a pattern inlaid inside of the text that points to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the third day. That blew me away. Maybe you guys already knew that. But <clears throat> that's in Genesis. The next account that we're going to go to, and really, there's one part that I missed there too, because there's, there's, there's a few themes that I want you to see. One, that God is doing this work. This is a, this is a work, an act of God. God is bringing about new life, right? And also, it is, it's connected with covenant. So even as he creates man, right, in his image, and then he, he tells them, have dominion, he, gives, he has this covenant, he ha says, go and subdue the earth. So he has a covenant with man in the beginning. And then as we go, you'll see these other covenants that are always taking place in relation to this. So, next we better hurry up. Okay. Next, we'll, we'll, we'll finish this, because here's the third part about it, and I forgot to, to mention this. God establishes this, this covenant with newly created creatures, with humans, in uh, Genesis 1, 28 and 29. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves upon the earth. And God said, See, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the land, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. So God creates a covenant with man, and it's in Eden. Where it, where it is is also important and points to the cross, points to, to Calvary. So in Eden, we see in Genesis 2, verse 10, it says that now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four river heads. So how do, how do rivers flow? I mean, do they flow uphill or downhill? Okay, so they flow downhill, so rivers flow downhill, so there, this is a high point. It is a mountain or a hill that a river is flowing out of and then, t and then breaking off into four other rivers. So at the top of a mountain or a hill in Eden, new life was created, and there was a covenant made by God to these people, to this new creation. And there is life, there is water, there is flowing out of this high point. Okay, this high point. Genesis 22. Genesis 22 and verses, we could read all of it. 1 through 19, I'd encourage you to read all of it, 1 through 19, and then, and then Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. We'll, read, we'll, we'll go through it. We'll see how fast we can go. After these events, God tested and proved Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. And offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and then began the trip to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, 
Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And Abraham said to his servants, Settle down and stay here with the donkey, and I and the young man will go yonder, yonder and worship and come again to you. And we'll stop right there. Now again, we're talking about the significance of Jesus pointing back to the third day. That he would be crucified, but rise again on the third day. When we look back to the account of Abraham and Isaac, what we see is that Abraham goes on a three-day journey with his son. He's been told that he's, that he's, he's been called the, to take his son, the son of promise, the son of covenant, actually, and go and sacrifice him. Which must have been, I mean, to the human heart, appalling and extremely hard to, to fathom. But if you read in Hebrews, we will go to Hebrews here, chapter 11. And verse 17 through 19. By faith Abraham, when he was put to the test, while the testing of his faith was still in progress, had already brought Isaac for an offering. He who had gladly received and welcomed God's promises was ready to sacrifice his only son, of whom it was said, Though Isaac shall be, through Isaac shall your descendants be reckoned. For he reasoned that God was able to raise him up even from among the dead. Indeed, in the sense that Isaac was figuratively dead, potentially sacrificed, he did actually receive him back from the dead. Does that make sense? So, when Abraham gets called to go and sacrifice his son, they set out. He had made the decision based on his, his understanding, his belief, that God, if God had given him this child of promise in which he was going to have, you know, descendants that, you know, outnumbered the stars and the grains of sand, you know, all of that. If, he, if God had promised him this, that if God was asking him to sacrifice his son, who was the son of promise, he believed that God would actually have to, it would be on God's timetable and God's plate to, to actually come through with the promise that he had given him. And he believed that God would do it, even if it meant raising him from the dead. So when he made that decision to start walking with his son, his son, to him, was as good as dead. You know what I mean? Dead in his heart. He had made that decision. Now, when he gets there, so here we go. We're going up a mountain again on a three-day journey. And there's going to be an interaction between God and man. And, and we're not going to read through the whole rest of this account. Go read it. It's It pictures and typifies both the father and the son and the willingness the willingness of the son to lay himself and be bound up and carry the wood up the mountain there's all these things that picture as as christ as a type go read go read all of it it's incredible but what happens is new life happens so when when that ram gets caught in the thicket and and abraham's ready to you know to kill his own son and then you know he hears the voice and, you know, no, no, I see, I see that you are, you are willing, you're faithful, you're willing to even sacrifice your own son, but God brings a sacrifice in his place. So here's Isaac. Well, he just got new life, right? He was just about dead. So there's newness of life, a new life for Isaac, and there's a newness of life for Abraham because that which he was about to lose, he just got back. So there's this newness of life, this new creation on the top of a mountain, and then there's a covenant. If you read the end of this, he says, it's attached to covenant. So he says, and I have sworn by, in verse 16, and, and said, I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that since you have done this and have not withheld from me or begrudged, giving me your son, your only son, in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your descendants, like the stars of the heavens and like the sand on the seashore, and your seed will possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed, Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and by him bless themselves, because you have heard and obeyed my voice. So even, again, God, outside of time, 
working inside of time, knowing and pointing to and, and actually establishing and preserving the seed that would bring about the Messiah, that would bring about Christ, who is the one whom nations either bless themselves or curse themselves, right? So, that's the Genesis 22 account. And you need Hebrews 11 to help you kind of get the context and understand a little bit of, of what Abraham was thinking and how he was operating in faith when he did that. So, another third day event. We have, if we go into the book of Exodus, chapter 19. So after the, after Israel has been, um, after the Hebrews have been delivered out of, you know, out of Egypt, out of the oppression of the Egyptians, they're, they, they, they wander through the wilderness and now they're coming once again to Mount Sinai. They're coming to a mountain, right? And they're about to enter into covenant with God. So, in chapter 19, we're going to read verses 2 through 11 here. When they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, they encamped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him out of the mountain, Say this to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice in truth, and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own peculiar possession and treasure from among and above all peoples. And all the earth is mine, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, consecrated, set apart to the worship of God. These are the words you shall speak to the Israelites. So again, we're looking at covenant and God giving Moses, uh, Moses, who is the mediator between him and the people, between the people and God, this message. Verse 7, so Moses called for the elders of the people and told them all these words which the Lord com commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. We're making a covenant here, so the people are engaging in this covenant with God. God's stipulating the covenant. The people are responding to this covenant. <clears throat> and Moses repeated, uh, reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, and the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you and remain steadfast forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Go and sanctify the people. Set them apart for God today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready by the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the cloud in the sight of all the people. And you shall set bounds for the people round about, saying, Take heed that you go not up in, into the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch it. Uh, or the offender, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows, whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and, sanctif and sanctified them, set them apart for God, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready by the day after tomorrow, do not go near a woman. In the King James, it says, he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives the third day. The third morning there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Read the rest of it. So on the third day, so there's a covenant happen, happening between God and God's people on a mountain, right, that is verified. He says, it's there. He's, why the third day? I mean, if you go back there, what's God's intention? Why didn't he just do it like, hey, Moses, go tell him right now. Come up. We're doing this right now. Why the third day? Why? Because he's pointing to Jesus. Because we can look back now and go, God, you had a plan all along. Amen. You were you were picturing Jesus in these scriptures. You, you had Jesus in mind. So what what is what does 
Israel get out of this as a nation? What's happening in that covenant? He says, you're going to be a people set apart for me for the worship of God. They were a, they have a new identity. They have, they've been delivered. Now they have this new life in God, in the true God worship, and in their identity in who God proclaims them to be as his nation. They have a new identity. That's incredible. That's what happened on Mount Sinai. That's what happened on that mountain. Okay. Now, if you go to Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. And I love the book of Jonah. I've, I've gotten the opportunity to, to teach out of Jonah and really study Jonah before. It's been a few years, but I really enjoyed studying this out. I would encourage you to study this whole, this whole book out with Christ in mind. It really is incredible. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared and appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now... I guess this one isn't technically on a mountain, but <laughs> it is pretty supernatural nonetheless, okay? I mean, it may be the most kind of uh, weird, you know? I mean, ha being swallowed up by, by a fish and then being as good as dead, or maybe some people might think he might have even died in there, right? And then being spat up with newness of life. And there's lots of other pictures of how Anyway, we're not going to get into the weeds there because Jesus just used it. He used that example of what happened with Jonah, who was going to, he was going, he was called as a Israelite. He was called as a prophet of God to go to a Gentile nation and preach repentance. And he didn't have a heart for those people and he didn't want to go. He ran the other way. Hopefully, you know the whole story, Right. But God is dealing with him, and he's dealing with the nation of Israel, he's, but he's also picturing him and his position in the midst of that. He's the one, the seas are roaring, and all the people around Jonah, right, all these other idol worshipers are there, and Jonah is the one that has to get thrown into the judgment, into the water, in order to calm the seas. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what Jesus did for us, non-Jews, us Gentiles, worshiping other gods. The seas were raging. Judgment was coming. We were dying. Somebody had to be the sacrifice. Jonah was the sacrifice there. Jesus is our sacrifice. Start putting the, if you start putting the pieces together. So, Hosea, one more. Chapter 6. And verses 1 and 2. Come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn so that he may heal us. He has stricken so that he may bind us up. After two days he will revive us, quicken us, give us life. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. Now, if you read throughout Hosea, God is dealing with the nation of Israel. And so, but I, I, what I'm talking about today is a pattern throughout the Old Testament that Jesus brings up and is pointing back to, that Paul is pointing back to, to hopefully give you great, you know, admiration for God and how much he has gone through in not, I mean, yes, in Christ, of course, that's the greatest sacrifice, but in all of history that you could be saved. This was his plan for you and me and your lost brother or your lost mom or your lost co-worker all along. God loves us so much, so very much. And he loves Israel. And so there's this example of them again. Now, Maybe they're looking back, maybe they were studying their own scriptures and going, there's something about God in creation, if we repent, getting newness of life the third day. I don't know how they saw it, I don't know if it's just the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but somehow, here back here in Hosea, you know, there's this, there's this type, there's this pattern that's happening. Jesus predicted and prophesied a third day resurrection 21 times in the New Testament 
in the in the Gospels, and it's regard you know it's all it's all also referenced in in other uh, the letters and and everything else in the New Testament. <clears throat> My hope is that this should give us a deeper understanding and 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 appreciation for the God who has saved us, for the God who died on that cross, was buried in that tomb, and rose on the third day. Um, this uh, pattern in the Old Testament, even from the creation narrative, is all pointing to the climactic example of the, of the creation of new life and the establishment of, of covenant with humanity that was accomplished in Christ Jesus on a hill years and years and years later. If you start to see the, the points connecting and dotting, it should just... It's just amazing. It's amazing. God still resurrects new life up from the tomb. We, I was encouraged this morning, a friend of ours who has made a lot of bad decisions and ended up in, uh, in jail, prison, you know, and, um, but you know what? She's getting baptized today. She's getting baptized today, you know. She's putting her faith in Christ. She's coming up out of that tomb, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And just as we have, you know. And I've got part of that poem. We're going we're gonna to play the song here in just a second. But that, hopefully, and if you go to Revelation 22, you go to Revelation 22. We, we're not gonna, I'm not going to go there right now. But if you go right there right now, you go into Revelation 22, what you see at the climation, the, the, the end of all things, is you see the throne of God and water coming and flowing through the throne of God. So that which was in Eden, you know, flowing down the river of God and life and fellowship and covenant that was broken, but Jesus redeemed, we have to look forward to. In Revelation, we have the throne of God, we have the river of life, we have the healing of the nations. It's been God's plan all along. And it's going to happen. It's amazing. So, he hung upon a cross of wood, but he made the hill on which it stood. This has been his plan from the beginning, and you and I are the recipients of amazing grace. Okay, go ahead, Tina.
of the universe, the maker of the universe, the maker of the universe. of the universe hung on that tree for you and for me but out of his death came life resurrection life and you know this morning I was just reminded by you know even my wife that every time I get to look at Jojo on the uh, the verge of death but God brought her new life amen hallelujah healed her heart in the physical but also spiritually. He is our heart healer. He gives us a new heart, you know, completely. Amen? Jojo, do you have something to say to everybody? Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter, everyone. Easter. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, so thankful for the cross, thankful for your plan of redemption from start to finish, Lord God, and the climactic point, Lord God, of your resurrection, Lord. We cling to that, Lord. We resound with praise and worship to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, Almighty God, we worship you in spirit and in truth. This is who you are. That's who you're looking for, Lord. Those of us that will sing your praises and do your good works, Lord. And I pray for this church and this place, Lord, that you would raise us up to do your will. Your will in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.